board. You guys go ahead and start. No, no, let me get you some coffee. Okay, thank you. Let's not. <laughs> All right. Headphones on. And we are good, I think. You want to clean up the uh, paper towels first? Yeah, actually, yeah. Kill it. Kill the mics. Kill the mics. Are you asking us? No. no, 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 not that way. Just hit the two mic buttons. These? Yep. All right, hi guys, hi listeners. This is Sean Richard with the Do Your Research. I am here with the two actors from Canfield Drive, Mike and Palmer. How you guys doing? Doing really good. We're doing good, Sean. How are you doing? I'm doing good. Uh, you guys just did. Uh, this is what your second play that I recorded with you. I believe the second one that you've recorded. Um, I think this is my third show with BCC. Yep, this is my second show at BCC. I believe this is our first show recorded together. You recorded uh, an evening with Edgar Allan Poe, correct? Yes, I did. All right, yeah, yeah, we were. Actually that was my first one. Yeah, we were not uh, in the show for that, but uh, this one it was a pleasure having you around. So, guys, um, got a question, few questions for you, for both of you. What got you into acting? What gave you the inspiration? You know, uh, me and Mike, uh, we've known each other for a while. You know, we actually grew up together, and uh, when we were younger, we just found love in play and doing what we like to do, watching our favorite TV shows and reenacting the scenes, and I feel like that just established a real aptitude for scene work and being alive on the stage and whatnot, and I feel like when we met David and found this great theater program here, it really blossomed into something great. Yeah, uh, to back on that... Uh it was, I think, my junior year. Uh, Palmer over here took a class over at Dartmouth High School, um, yep. just like a theater arts class. And um, I remember he actually wrote a fantastic play at the time. And um, I remember that actually influenced me to watch it. Uh, to get Actually, I took the class my senior year. And um, after that, I actually did a musical at Dartmouth High and then just became a theater major over here. But I really probably would credit his, uh, his great work of... Uh, Playwriting. <laughs> you know, I almost forgot about that, Mike. That's that's really funny you bring that up. But uh, yeah, I I, uh, I wrote a uh, a small uh, one act play back in high school called Tales from a Chicago Alleyway, and it was it was a real interesting piece. And uh, we actually performed it for a group of English classes at the time. And I think Mike was in one of those English classes, unless he yep. snuck Correct. off in Mr. the bathroom Karen's or class. something. <laughs> and uh, saw that and kind of triggered our love for it. And then the f year following that, Mikey won out, auditioned for the our school's big production of Beauty and the Beast, killed the lead, and here we are now. So another question is, you guys did some acting classes together, which I understood. What is the difference between Canfield and all the other acting, um, acting roles that you've done? That's a good question, you know. Uh, I feel that uh, Canfield is a real, real story. You know, it's a it's a heavy topic, definitely. And a lot of the characters in the story are actually real life people. So like, there's a certain uh, bar that you have to meet when it comes to bringing those people to life in an authentic way. Did you do any researches on your characters while in the um, in the play itself? Like, for example, Mike, you did um, Darren Wilson. Yep. Did you do any research on or even looked up any of the stuff that he was, how he mentioned himself on on his situation? No, yeah, I mean, definitely. There was a full uh, interview. Uh, I don't know if people caught this, but uh, Palmer's character, uh, Brad, actually transformed to George Stephanopoulos. Um during the scene with Darren Wilson, and um, there's the actual interview that that's based off of. Uh, I watched that whole thing, kind of tried to get, like, some of Darren's traits with it. But uh, one of the uh, directions, like, in an artist form that we uh, decided was that Darren Wilson was just kind of this, like, robot of a person. So I think, like, the research came. 
But I think, like, the director's vision of, like, you know, being really stiff and stuff really changes that. But definitely a lot of research. And w- one of my characters definitely uh, the mayor. Uh, James Knowles III, he's an actual character uh, in real life. He's the mayor of uh, Ferguson, yeah, yeah. Ferguson, Missouri. So did a lot of research on him. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it's really cool when you're actually doing, like, real-life people. You know, I had uh, I had Jeff Smith at one time, who was a, a former senator of Missouri, and uh, so it was really cool to actually look at a video of that guy talking and actually have a thing to look at and try to emulate that person's mannerisms and movements and way of talking. So my next question is, for you guys, is this play really 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 struck a lot of people did you guys get at any time during rehearsal do you guys get frustrated with your characters at all like how you was making them and how you was bringing them about up uh definitely yeah to put it shortly yeah a, a huge struggle for me was trying to get inside of brad's bigoted thinking in the way he really just does not care about facts or truth he really just wants to say his own agenda based on a bias that he refuses to think outside of. Yeah, I know. Uh, one of the things that I really uh, had a struggle with thinking about was uh, the fact that um, I guess Michael Brown's father and brother were um, in Massachusetts around the time that we did this production, and um, we invited them to come see the show. And um, I think I play some pretty uh, twisted characters yeah. in the show, definitely. And uh, I think it definitely would have been a struggle uh, playing Darren Wilson, you know, in front of <laughs> in front of his father and brother. But I think you know it would have also been like, you know, it's understandably it's art yeah, at the end of the day. You know what I mean? Exactly. But I think that definitely was a struggle thinking about like in terms of the characters. Yeah, and as much of a struggle as it is, when you look at the whole thing as a piece, uh, the time in that we're doing is really point of this play is to prolong the memory and not let us forget about what happened on that day and I think that in itself whether you're playing the antagonist or the protagonist is the good fight so guys there is one other question how did you bring your characters what I'm trying to say is how did you bring your characters into into your feelings for for example um, Mike you had Darren Wilson and you probably hid the guy, and you probably hid the role. But how'd you overcome playing him? Yeah, I mean, okay, so one of the biggest things I always face, like, if you're playing, like, in terms of this play, I would consider Darren Wilson one of the villains. And I guess when you're playing a villain, you got to almost not see them as a villain for it to be, you know, for to get the response you want. And so, you know, I had to put my mindset into that I was doing the right thing. I was just... a cop a newly trained police officer who was just doing my job and what i thought was right and you know what that character's views are are definitely different than what my personal views are as an actor but you know at the end of the day if we are actors that's what our job is is to portray the character's mindset palmer same question when you was playing brad o'connor uh you know i yeah i felt like uh his real aggressive mannerisms and the fact that he's so swelled deeply in this this thought process of like we didn't do anything she he basically wants to gaslight Amani any chance he get and not actually listen and let what she's saying affect him in a in a human way but how does that affect you in real life is that your personality in real life oh not at all you know i i feel like separating that character from myself was difficult but uh i felt like i i really just kind of had to tap into states where i'm arguing with people over a different topic and whatnot, and I would kind of connect that to his ideologies and thinking. We're also going to start, uh, start taking some calls if you guys have any questions. The phone number is 508-732-3272. Please call in, and uh, we would love to hear from our, our listeners out there. Call us up. So anyway, guys, um, about any other plays, you guys uh, working on anything else besides that's out of school or in school? Uh, yeah, so uh, we actually, uh, tonight and tomorrow, we got some uh, BCC production auditions for uh, uh, Our Town. It's an American classic, uh, so that's definitely on the radar. 
coming up next uh, in terms of theater. Why don't you yep. explain what Our Town is? Because it seems like to me it's me. I just moved from from New Bedford, lived in New Bedford all my life, and I saw this production called Our Town. Never heard of it. Never even known about it. So it seems like you're talking about Fall River, or is that a different? Yeah. So Our Town. I um I've been doing some research into it as far as what I know. Um, don't definitely uh. Take my word for, I know, like, a little bit about it, but um, I believe it's set in a New Hampshire town. Um, and I believe it, it's three acts. Yeah, there's three acts. It's broken into, you know, the childhood, like, the everyday life of this town. And then act two is definitely about, like, the love. Everyone starts to get married and everything like that. And then act three is about death. And I believe one of the characters, I'm not sure if it's George or I believe her name's Emily, one of them dies. And it's about, um, you know, just kind of the complacency of everyday life. And I believe to follow that, we're actually, um, uh, David, uh, David Ledoux, our director, is working on a devised piece called Our Stories to follow it up, and it's going to be about the people of New Bedford and kind of their stories, and we're going to kind of work with, I believe, the Our Town story. Oh, uh, sounds, like, sounds like I can, get it, I can get my hands on this one. Yeah, definitely. Oh, yeah. I'm looking forward to it, you know, it's, it's really uh, an interesting play, there's a uh, a lot of uh, miming going on during the play. There's uh, a bunch of townspeople doing interesting changes. And most of the characters are actually seated in the audience during the play. And then when it comes time for their, their time to go out, they come up, go do their thing. You know, like there's certain people, like there's a milkman, and uh, the milkman is leading his imaginary cow. Like there's no real cow there, and he's, come on, Bessie, come on, Bessie, leading her through, you know? It's really an interesting take on society. Are you guys nervous of going from a small stage to a bigger stage? No, nah, not at all. Um, I believe actually, to follow that up, I think actually being in the smaller space is a little bit more challenging. You know, not challenging, but you're in a more intimate space, you know, where yeah, a proscenium totally theater, agree. you're kind of, the lights kind of honestly fade out the audience. But I think either way, you can't really think about it as, you know, there's an audience there. And at the end of the day, I think the audience is there and they want to see you do a good job. So you just kind of got to give them that. Yeah, but exactly. No, I think the black box is definitely has a different element of challenging to it where it's like the audience is right there. So it's more of like a a movie interaction where it's like your facial expressions are so visible to them and every little detail you can put on is going to be noticed. So my next question is for you guys is what do you guys what is your majors here? Uh, currently, I am a uh, liberal arts leaning psychology. And Mike? I'm a theater major. Really? Yeah. Uh, so what do you plan on doing? Um, yeah, I just got some auditions coming up for some various schools and then kind of just going from there to whatever comes next. But definitely want to lead in the direction of staying with theater and eventually transitioning to film. We have a good friend, uh, Will Wheaton, up in Boston, who's doing... Uh, Oh, he's working on film editing and directing and stuff like that, so we're good need, working with him. I need to get in touch with that dude. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, need I definitely need work. I definitely need to get in touch with that dude because of the work that I've been doing here is is okay work. Yeah. They're doing what the equipment I'm I'm using is okay, but I wanna use better equipment so mm-hmm. I can do better filming. Yeah, Palmer and I actually we just shot um a great uh one of one of Will's uh first kind of like the stories he wrote and we kind of brought it to life for him, kind of acted it out. Yeah, yeah, it's a uh, it's a it's a really interesting picture. It's about two brothers on a farm, and uh, they live in Pennsylvania, and uh, they're going through some turmoil. They uh, they're working on the farm by themselves now. They've been they've recently uh, succeeded their grandfather in owning it, and. Uh, one of the brothers starts to feel that he wants to get off the farm and leave and go do other things, meet girls in the city and whatnot. And the other farm is has those traditional beliefs of staying and completing what the grandfather would have wanted them to do, and they end up coming to uh, coming to odds against that. You guys got any questions for me? Yeah, I actually do have a question for you. Um, so uh, I believe uh, I remember that in the beginning of the Canfield Drive process, you actually uh, were at some of the table reads and everything, correct? Yes, I was. Um, I was just wondering, how was that process? Like, you know, seeing just the words on the script and how far yeah. those words translated into how each actor portrayed them and put the emotions behind them that 
they actually have. Because, you know, I see a lot of people describe scripts as kind of just like the bones and the outline of a project. So I just wanted to see how you felt the bones translated to the whole body of the story. Well, um, I've been put on the spot like that. But to answer your question fairly is this is actually the first time I actually wrote, I mean, read a script that was actually in front of me. So I didn't know how those characters were were going to be. Mm-hmm. So as we did this rehearsal, the script rehearsal, they wanted me to read Armani, Brad, or Marcus. I didn't know what Marcus was like, but I chose that he was going to be an African-American person because of the way that it was written. Yeah. Armani seemed like a female that could be borderline to a white or more as an African-American person because... Well, I believe in the script, yeah, definitely. There's some stage directions for... It. She's definitely the African-American voice behind But I'm saying is the, the scripts that we was reading for rehearsal... Oh, okay. Was it could be borderline, and I didn't. So I was like, "Is she white?" I was like, get a little, little confused. Then it came down onto where I had no idea until actually I sit down with you guys and I read everything and I found out it was the Michael Brown case. I'm like, okay, oh. "Oh, so you were talking about the auditions?" Before. So oh, yes, yeah, okay. so I'm talking about the auditions before any of this. So I'm like, "Okay, cool." I I have no idea what Canfield Drive is. I, yeah. I was like. All right, I'm going to try to play the actor. Okay, drill sergeant. All right, cool. I was in Young Marines. I can pitch in my head. I got my uh, my gunnery sergeant, Ryan Ishwood, stuck in my head because he was my he was one of my drill instructors, and so was Christopher White at the time. And I remember those guys yelling in my air, yelling in my face, and then I have my officers, who was above all, Real, if you screwed up with those drill instructors, you was getting hit with the yeah. with the officers, yeah. and the officers, you don't want to get hit with those because I remember one of the officers, rest in peace, Officer Meehan, Dean Meehan, uh, he died uh, back in two thousand seventeen. I want to say two thousand sixteen, seventeen. But anyway, I remember him. First day in boot camp. Oh, you're going to melt off to me. Yeah. Yeah, I am, because I got something to prove. Oh, you do? <laughs> Who's going to see how many push-ups you can do? That's when I knew I was in trouble. <laughs> I knew I was in trouble. As soon as he said, let's see how many, because I know I can do more than you. So it was more of an attitude for me as readjustment but to answer, to go back to your question Mike yeah I had no idea until I actually sat down wanted to see the outcome of what I was going to do for the next for the next rehearsals for the judge rehearsals that you guys were doing and I actually wanted to see your characters that's why I stepped in for a few of those a few of those uh, rehearsals because I had nothing to do I mean yeah. I want to see what what was going to happen, what I was going to film, and see if I can catch you guys off guard and start filming some stuff. Yeah. But I never got the okay from Don, which was the director at the time. And so I was like, okay. Yeah. Speaking a few words about Don, <coughs> um, Don Mays. He was, um, Don Mays. We brought him in. Uh, I guess David um, got in contact. Don Mays, is, uh, he's from Providence, and he's I guess he's a local director over there. And uh, Bristol Community College, we brought him in, I guess, uh, to direct this show. And it was definitely just a pleasure. He was a great director. Yeah, I know. Uh, Don, I think, is is a great, great director. You know, he was really finds ways to be constructive. He makes you be alive, and he makes you feel more authentic. You know, and he's also, uh, Don Mays is doing a performance, uh, he's directing a performance of The Crucible, correct? No, not The Crucible. I forgot what it was. Um, we'll play, it was a musical. It was a but, musical. Um, yeah. uh, okay, well, it's performing at the, uh, the Wilbury Theater, at uh, March 5th, I believe. Yeah. Right? Okay. Where is that? Well, the free... It's in Rhode Island. I never heard of it. And check, uh, you guys got to check it out. One of the other cool things about Don, actually, uh, we had live painting going on during Canfield Drive, and uh, one of our painters unfortunately stepped down. Uh, he had some conflicts going on, but Don picked up the paintbrush and live painted during the show, which is really cool to see. And that was I mean, at so. Canfield Drive, yep. just so the audience knows. 
And yes, I did get some of those footages, but what happened to the paintings after the show? Oh, that's a good um, question. I mean, my first thought was that they would go up in the art galleries, possibly, to promote the theater program and, uh, and everything that went on. But, I mean, they might have got thrown away. I would hope not. I mean, the paintings were gorgeous. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I know um, one of the painters, uh, I let me get his name real quick, because he's <laughs> very talented. He was the other painter who, um, who helped us with the whole process. Yeah, he came yeah, in. Yeah, get him on there. It was um, beautiful work. You can find him on uh, Instagram, canvas underscore freedom. Um, his name's JB. He did some crazy work. Like, look yeah, at that over wow. there. Oil painted. The that Joker. is a picture of a Joker, and it looks like to be... I, I, I don't know who that canvas is. Underscore um, freedom. Yeah, it's Joaquin Phoenix. He oil painted. He does a lot of work, but, you know, it was really cool bringing in all these people and um, actually the actress who put, portrayed Imani over there. Um, Alexis Ingram, she's a, um, a professional actress who came in. Yep. So we had a lot of like professional people come in and work with this show. And it was definitely a great experience and learning experience for us mm -hmm. as students. Mm -hmm. So you, are you guys going to be doing some any acting outside of school too or just inside the school? Yep, we've, uh, I mean, we're, we're doing that project with Will Wheaton right now. Uh, we're actually... Uh, we're shooting a, a startup TV show called Hood Street, which is based off a, a book. And uh, the author of the book is actually producing the TV show. That's uh, Hood Street. And uh, hopefully we can get picked up by a streaming service shortly once we're done filming the first four episodes. And where are you guys filming that at? Uh, it's in Connecticut. Yeah, the first film we did was at a convenience store in New London, Connecticut. And... I believe the other filming section we're doing is in Springfield, Mass. Yeah. So, pretty cool. Yeah, we uh, we play Officer Markowski and Officer Rich, uh, Richards. Yeah, yeah great. Here's my last name, will you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to steal it from you. Yeah, I guess so. <laughs> so, Palmer, do you have any questions for me at all? Or did I answer some of your stuff? You know, uh, I wanted to think, I want to ask you about... Uh, really about uh, your experience in, in filming plays. Is this your first time filming theater? This is my second time. My first time was doing Egg and Allen Oh, yeah, 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 we discussed. So this is my second time. I actually want to get your opinion on what show did you like better, Egg and Allen Poe or this one? It's not up yet. It's not up yet. It will be up. I'm actually working on another project right now. It's uh, called, give me like one second, I gotta look this up. Yeah, well you looked that up, I just kind of want to bounce that question. So it was it was kind of tough uh, to answer that question. They're very, I don't think, you know, you can really compare as like a favorite. And yeah, yeah, from our no. perspective, we, we were in the audience for Edgar Allan Poe. Exactly. Uh, they invited us to the night before. Because, yeah, we, we watched a dress rehearsal and it was it was fabulous. terrific. Yeah, and yeah. you know they actually devised that piece and a devised piece of theater. They gain influence from uh, the work of Edgar Allan Poe. They just yeah. read that and came up with the whole story from there. You know, where this was a real tragic event that happened in America. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So exactly, definitely, both are just powerful great artwork and the, the play we did was actually a, a play that has already been crafted and written and wrestled with but Edgar Allan Poe was a devised piece so that is our theater director David Ledoux just going into this thing no clue what it's going to be it has like a few outlines like obviously he knows it's going to be centered around Edgar Allan Poe and whatnot in his work but other than Some that, of the works like the Raven. Exactly, yeah, exactly, exactly. But other than that, the the story is completely crafted through scratch. I mean, like, it, all it is is just improvising, creating tableaus, and wrestling with themes and topics that you have picked out. Yeah, Palmer and I actually had the pleasure last um, our first semester here at Bristol. Uh, we worked on a device piece, uh, the God that you serve. Mm -hmm. um, and that was really cool. I believe that was David's first show. Uh, don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure that was one of David's first shows at Bristol. I, I believe. I'm and, not, um, yeah, don't quote us on that, but yeah. yeah. And he, be. Palmer actually played God in that, and that was definitely a great experience. You know, it was yeah. in the same black box theater Canfield Drive was in. So being in that small space, we built ramps to kind of really create <laughs> levels and have God up top. I don't know if you got to see the show. No, I did oh, not. Okay. I, I, um, I wasn't un I was unaware, but the... Um, the piece I'm working on is called the Cherish Form Act, and that act is about students like us 
not to have a big student loan debt. When we graduate from school or we go to school, we are trying to eliminate that student loan to see if we can actually go to school for free. Mm -hmm. So that's what the act that is all about. And that's the one I shot. That's the one I'm editing right now. After I'm done with that, then I'm going to be editing your show. Okay. Nice. And, yeah, then, yeah. and then I'll be editing this one. Yeah, definitely let us know. I definitely want to see some copies of that. Want to let us know where we can access that? As a matter of fact, um, David Ledoux is going to give me more CDs, so I'll be past as many as actors there were. Is that going to be online for the listeners to uh Yes, to it's, yeah. it's also going to be on my YouTube page, but it's going to be a link. The link is going to be hidden to those who I send the link out to. Okay. So if... The two people who are going to have that link is me and David. Me, because I want to get my videos out more, but I only can do it because it's because it falls in the student guidelines where it's a, a privacy for you guys. I can't have it. Uh, in the public, uh, yeah. on public, in the public no, eye. The laws and regulations so and stuff like that. that's the reason why I have it restricted. So whoever wants to see it, I have to show him, show them off of my YouTube cast, which is my portfolio. So a lot of my videos, what I want people to see is actually on my portfolio, and that's one of them. Now, what whatever David decides to do with his link, that's up to him. Yeah. What I know that the last link it um, it's on is actually on the Theater Club, well, uh, Theater Club's Facebook page, I believe, of the Egg and Allen Poe, and I got him the two copies. One of the co the two reasons for the two copies was technical difficulties on Saturday on Saturday the first run. The first run was when my tripod that I was using decided to for the legs to give out so that meant the camera was tilting the whole nut the whole time and it wasn't staying proper the other night was i got i felt like i got too much of headshots like mm -hmm. the back of the people's heads and that happened on the same same tripod different scenario though I just got too many head be people behind the headshots. So, and the, the camera decided to unplug my headphones. Got to back off of that, Sean. I have a question. Uh, have you ever worked on any, like, film things? Because my question was, like, how is going to be the difference between, you know, working on, like, a film set where you can just cut it if your camera or something malfunctions you, to, like, live theater where you can't interrupt you to go back. You know what I mean? Either one, you cannot cut. That's yeah. when you go into editing and then you do the cuts. But as a live theater, whatever you're shooting live, you can't really edit anything out or you can't really even remake because once you shot, you shot. Yeah, exactly. And for theater, it's... Not difficult, but it is like it's more. How am I gonna put this? It's you ever have a live TV show? Yeah, it's the same thing live theater, live TV show. You can't edit it out, okay. you can't shut off your camera when you're doing a movie, you're doing something where you can make the cuts director's cut you can unplug your camera at that time or you can do hey i want i want you to do that re uh scene over again i want you to do this over again um i don't like it do it over again that's when you can make all the changes and you as the editor you can actually make whatever fits better so yes um to answer your question what do one think your question was what do i like to do better do I like to do live or do I like to edit? Either way, I have to edit. Yeah. So, so there's either way I have to edit, but there's not much editing when you're doing a live live show. Okay. But there are more me there are more mess ups in a live than they are in as a cut through. So, do you enjoy doing like like the movie style shoots though, where it's more of like 
you you get to be a more a little more crafty. You have a lot more room for like things you can do, where it's like conversational, like film pieces, <sighs> splicing dialogue together and whatnot. You're talking about editing, or you're talking about editing? Yeah, editing. I like to like to do my own editing, and. So I like to make the conversations where people have when they talk to each other. Um, I kind of like to leave that in there because it gives the audience a better understanding of what the conversation is about, if that answers your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So if I do that, then I know I'm a great editor. Mm -hmm. And I also like to throw my pieces of what I like to show is the, to the audience is that I want to know I want to make sure the audience knows that it was me editing. Every person that edits has their own style and format of and their own masterpiece of editing. Exactly, where, yeah. where they where not many people will catch it. Yeah, definitely. We only only the in. only the editor. Only an editor can catch his own mistakes or his own improvs. Mm -hmm. Well, I think that's one of the cool things, like, we've learned at our time here at Bristol in detail is, like, all the different little jobs that go into every single part of theater or film, whatever you're doing, exactly. there are so many people behind the scenes that are doing things, and they don't even get the credit most of the time, you know what I mean? Like, we have so many people who build our sets, they work, like, tireless hours exactly. doing our lighting, all these things, so you know what I mean? Thoughts and decisions. Costumes, all these things, yeah. they go into it, you don't really think about it on the surface, you know, but... Like, it's all there, like, even in film, like you're saying, like, the editing and stuff like that. You have the people, the lighting, the sound, everything. I try to, f whoever helps out, like, if I can get them, in the, especially the people in the background, I like to add them to my to my videos. Unlike Egg and Allan Poe, I was uneligible to do that because I didn't have the names for the background people. So if I did have the names for the background people, I could actually edit them and give them the credit mm -hmm. for what they deserve. Same thing with Canfield Drive. I didn't have the sources. I just had a a program yeah, that I'm going exactly. off of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the program leaves out the people in the back. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think, David and... Don, I hope you guys are listening because I'm going to give you guys suggestions right now. What would be the greatest thing to when you're making the program is making sure that everybody is guest known. I mean, they, even they the, do have even, the lights and sound and stage manager and whatnot, but yeah, I feel like some maybe some of the stage crafting people are probably not listed. You're correct. I, I, I don't know. I haven't really looked at the program yeah. lately, but I know for a fact for Egan Allen Paul, I didn't credit everybody in yeah. that. Oh, I just yeah, I yeah, just yeah. credited the actors. Mike, I'm pretty sure that you've seen the the video I shot on YouTube. The Poe one? The Poe yep, one. Yep, yep. I was at a uh, – David was doing a um, – just like theater convention, just getting some clubs to sign up for stuff, and he was actually displaying it. I'm pretty sure it was your work over there, so uh, it looked great. You know, the lighting in that show was terrific, and I think on camera you translated it really well. So, yeah. did you see the yeah. ending of the edit of the editing? The what I'm trying to say is, did you see the credits? Yeah, the uh, yep, I did actually see that in did, the order of appearance. Yeah, did I question to you because I don't remember yeah. that show was yep. three. Four or five months ago. Yeah. Did I mention everybody in there, or did I leave a few people out? Uh, you know, that's a tough one off the top of my <laughs> head. I'm not, you know, really not, not memorizing the credit uh, list. Um, but you know, I do remember definitely at least seeing every single actor. I even believe seeing. Don't quote me on this again, but I believe seeing some of the people behind the scenes getting credited in that. Mm -hmm. You know, but even if they didn't, you know, definitely the credits always there. Yeah, for Canfield Drive, I I know there was a, there was a section. We had uh, Rebecca Devar as our stage manager, and then we had lights, sound, and everything listed. But uh, you could be right; Edgar Allan Poe could have been mis miscredited. Uh, we weren't sure. We didn't. Again, we didn't do the Poe show, so uh, unfortunately, we missed that one. We don't know much about mm -hmm. what happened with that show. Beautiful show. Behind the scenes. Beautiful yeah. show. Did we, you Did you guys get the chance to take a look at it on my YouTube channel, or did you pass the did you guys get the links? No, yeah, we I, like again. I, I saw it at that thing. I saw it there. Um, I believe I saw it even at the library once. 
Um, so I've seen it all around. I haven't seen that on YouTube though. Oh, uh, then I have to give you my YouTube link, and so that way you can get a chance to yeah, look definitely. at it. Yeah. Get a chance to look at the whole thing. What's like the name of uh, the YouTube channel for the for everyone out there? Uh, the YouTube channel is it's gonna be really tough to find, but I will give everybody a chance to look it up. Mm-hmm. Oh, look at that! My YouTube channel. If you can look up Sean Richard, you're going to have um, a few different things on there to subscribe me. I have eight subscribers. And... Yeah, we're going to... Um, we're in the process. Probably this summer we're in development. But uh, we're just going pretty much by the name. Us and uh, some of our boys, longtime boys from high school, uh, Sack Chasers Media. Yep. Quick little shout out. We're in development there. We're going to be doing interviews and everything like that. If you guys need to, I know I have Ben Gilberg as one of my YouTube subscribers. I know he subscribed to my YouTube account. If you can find Ben Gilberg. And there's actually an interview with me interviewing Ben. That is one way of getting my link to my YouTube account. That might be easier for the viewers to grab. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, I have another question for you, Sean. So how long, uh, you've been at BCC um, since before the theater program got re- uh, rebooted, correct? Because there was a time... Before David came, I, I, th- I think that there was no theater program. No, there right? was. There, there was. was always? Okay. There was. Uh, so, what, did they not do productions for a while? Or? No, it was Brennan. Uh, Ryland Brenner? Uh, yeah, 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 okay, yeah, yeah, that guy. He, um, he was here from the time of me starting here at BCC, and then somewhere at, my, I think, my first or second year here where he actually up and left so there was always a theater program there was always a theater program but who was running it it was always a question okay yeah i wasn't sure about that because i was gonna say like i feel like i feel like in terms of like the theater program i feel like it's come like a very long way you know what i mean it's definitely built up like i feel like a good reputation from from what I hear right now and what I see, Ryan, no disrespect to you, Ryan and Brenner, but there was more advertising being done by the theater program as when David Ledoux was taken over mm-hmm. than when he, when Ryan Brenner was taken over. Yeah, you think David's that's great in that way. I feel like he, he's got a, a real knowledge of uh, how to access people in today's world, and I, I feel like he's really taken advantage of that and given our, our theater program a nice push forward. But not to knock anything away from Ryan Brenner or David LaDue, but Ryan Brenner also sold out shows mm-hmm. here at BCC. Yeah, and um, I, I believe so, Canfield so, Drive had a sell out run. Uh, no, 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 I'm talking, about, I'm talking about Ryan Brenner now. Oh, so okay. he, he also had so, sold out shows, but with minor, minor, and I'm really being serious about this, with minor... Um, advertising. Okay. So where you have now posters posted on almost all the way going yeah. all the way there down to go. B BCC out in New Bedford. Yeah. And I don't know about Taunton because I haven't been out there, but sad to say, I think Taunton's campus is about to go down. I don't know. Yeah, I went to the Taunton Mall the other day. It was a ghost town. Yeah. Crazy. Did you see all the stores that they said it was? Yeah, had bye-bye. so many sales. Yeah, there was. Um, I probably stopped by three or four just looking for some of those like eighty percent off deals. But it's really sad, you know. Malls were an American staple for such a long time. I, I know it, it's it's really. I sad. remember actually, like when I was a kid. I don't even know how I remember this, but at one point there was like a bungee jumping thing in the middle of the top. Yes. Mall. Yeah, yeah. Yes. So I was like, wait a second, this is that mall. But like now it's literally like. All, like, three of the wings are, like, completely empty in that mall. It's crazy, so. Yeah, where are kids going to go now? You know, they just have to sit on their phones at home. Yeah, one of the, it's crazy that, you know, the Dartmouth Mall somehow is it, the one, it, only one standing. Want to like, know why? Why? Why do you think that? I can tell you why. Reason is, what's around Taunton? Nah, there's nothing. What, what, what's around Taunton? All you have is one city, and that's Taunton. What's around Dartmouth? Yeah, New, Fall Bedford, River, New Bedford. Fall River, a cushion it. Rochester, East Freetown. You got so many, uh, so many towns around 
around the mall yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. that it's not going to be a long of a forbidden drive. Yeah, yeah, and it's like in the middle of a mall too, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I just, you know, I find it crazy that this Ton Mall was this big, like, two-story mall, you know what I mean? And Dartmouth Mall is so little in comparison, but I, I read somewhere, and in terms of percentage-wise, it's one of the most filled malls in America to the, today. Which is who? Dartmouth. In terms of, like, oh, how yeah. many stores they have, like, in terms of open and close ratio. Oh, yeah, but... That's crazy. But, you know what says it's got the number one? Who? Mall of America. Yeah, where's that? Is that Ohio, right? Or? Minnesota. Minnesota, okay. Yeah, I was fortunate to go there. Yeah? Yeah, they got a theme park right inside. Yeah, theme park? Yeah. <laughs> they, they do, they really do. They got a, they, they got a roller coaster. They even got water slot, um, water rides down down uh, down in there. And they also have their own rollerblading. And wow. If, if you ever seen the Mighty Ducks, the first movie. Oh, I love Mighty Ducks. They, they, that's where they shot... One of um, no, the first two movies was actually Mall of America. Yeah. Mall of America. That's awesome. Wow. Hey, John, do you mind mentioning the the phone number for the the source again? Yes, it's five zero eight. Uh, five zero eight seven three zero three two seven two. Let's see if we can get some callers to call in. I know. Let's see. Yeah, definitely. Call call in. In. We're clocking in some viewers. With the time that's given to us. Oh, yeah. So, uh, what other, um, besides acting, is there any other things that you guys like to do? Uh, you know, that- back in the day, uh, we were big sports people. Uh, big sports I, people. I played baseball, uh, played basketball for one season, put up nine whole points, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, nine, yeah nine, nine whole points. all season, you know what I mean? <laughs> but, uh, you know, definitely, we like kicking back, playing some sports, going, yeah, yeah. shooting some hoops. We're big we music guys, you know, we love, uh, we love hanging out and, and jamming, you know, I actually, I've been playing guitar for seven years, and, uh, my buddy here likes to play the sax, he's also a, a gifted, uh, percussionist. He was in the marching band for a while. Really? Yeah, I did marching band all of high school. Went I, I, didn't know, I didn't know he was listening. Thank you, Andrew, for listening to us, and hopefully this will change your mind. Please come back. <laughs> yeah, my other person who... You had a caller? No. Uh. He, he, no, he's just listened to... Uh. He's just listening to us right now. His oh, name nice. his name is Andrew Blank. He just sent me a text. Nice. So I'm kind of saying thank you to him. Yeah. Really? They're having a trouble connecting to the radio. Yeah. No, but we, we definitely bond a lot over making music together, and uh, we're, we, we love the Red Hot Chili Peppers. We're really yeah. ex- excited yep. about the announcement of... John Frusciante rejoining the band after his seven-year hiatus, and we're going to go be seeing them at Boston Calling in spring. I remember um, in the summer, we actually did a summertime production of uh, Much Ado About Nothing, um, where uh, Palmer here played Baraccio, yep. and I played Claudio, and um, I remember we had some long car rides up the Cape, and um, yes. oh. yeah, we, um, we drove all the way to Marion one day, and we played the Neil Young's Powder Finger. Really? Like... Probably on repeat the entire day. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, yeah, definitely, like what he said, music definitely got us through those long, tiring days, but, you know, just singing some Neil Young really got us through. People there just want to be like, Palmer and Mike, like, shut up! (laughs) Just always singing And our, like, peaceful, like, yeah, Neil Young, like... (laughs) Have to have that element for a happy rehearsal space for us. Yeah, definitely. (laughs) You know, uh, if you guys are actually into music like that, you guys could probably help me out even a little bit better. You guys can meet a friend of mine. His name is Lance, and he's actually a guitarist. Oh, yeah? So he's also trying to start his own band, and if you guys are actually interested, I can get you to hook up with that, and then that way... Yeah, that'd be good. And, and, yeah, and definitely. Instead of, instead of letting the listeners vote, because that's what I was originally going to have them do... Uh, for who would they want to come back to the next show is that I can say, hey, look, here's three guys. They they want to play the battle of the bands. They're trying to compete to see who nah. is going to be my music producer. So I was like, 
I brought that to uh, to my friend to the other producer's idea. They said that's actually a really really good idea. Are you a uh, are you a John Fogerty guy at all, uh, Sean? John who? John Fogerty. Don't know who he is. Lead singer of Creedence Clearwater Revival. He's the lead, he's, he's lead singer of Creed? Yeah, no, Creed, CCR. No, that's Scott Stapp. I've actually met Scott Stapp. I heard it through the grapevine. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> yeah. It ain't me. It well, ain't me. But, uh, I ain't no fortunate one. Man. Oh, that, that guy? Yeah, mm-hmm. you know, if you, okay. ever need, if you ever need that sound, uh, I remember this one time we were in Maine, <laughs> and uh, we were sitting by a fire, and I think, uh, you know, John Fogarty really uh, channeled uh, Palmer. His ghost was around the campfire. It, it, it was really, I don't even think he's dead, but his ghost is definitely around <laughs> the campfire. <laughs> we're actually going to go see him at Foxwoods in a couple of months. Yeah, but uh, I, I have His yeah. presence. He was really, he really channeled his inner John Fogarty there, and it was really a... <laughs> Spectacle to see, in my opinion. Yeah, you know, I think we were uh, we were actually doing a I was playing r- some rendition of drum on uh, that. Rock and Sydney's "Don't Mess with My Toot Toot." I don't know. I know that song. Yeah, you know, yeah, actually, I, yeah, I, yeah. I know that song. My um. Don't mess with my, my toot toot. Ready? No, it's toot the root. It's toot the root. It's it's toot the root. It's toot the root. It's toot the root. Toot the root. Hell yeah. It's um that song has been so old and nobody Yeah, uh, definitely it's a classic. It, nobody knows it, so when mm-hmm. uh someone pisses me off, I'll jam I'll just literally put something else on just to be annoying <laughs> and I will put it on and just go, Sean, shut it off. <laughs> I go, not till the song's over. I need my tutor. No, and then what I'll do is it, I'll, act, I'll make it act like the song's over, but it's not. I got another, like, four or five minutes because I got a reloop. <laughs> so you're really there. <laughs> I'm waiting for the song to be over. And you're actually, like, looking at the clock going, dude, it's nine minutes. <laughs> when is the song going to end? Wait a minute. You had this thing on re- Oh, you're so dead. <laughs> yeah, right. Good luck. Don't mess with the prankster. No, definitely. Yeah, you yeah, you, you can't. You can't. Because I remember... Gonna get burned. Oh well, this one dude thought he was gonna prank me re- really, really good. Mm-hmm. So he's he shot me for Christmas. He gets me a, I'm a gay, I love to fart, and these are all mugs. And then yeah. he buys me gay socks. I was like, okay, I'm gonna get you back. He says you're not gonna get me back. I don't buy it. Okay. You'll see. <laughs> and he learned. No, he left all his stuff at my house. What do you think happened to all his stuff? What happened to it? It's Christmas time. What do you think happened? Did you wrap it all? Dude, not only did I wrap it all, I found flyers. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> I found flyers, duct tape, and grill go. He couldn't take the flyers off at all. He couldn't even take anything <laughs> out outside his box because it was grill oh glue. <laughs> he goes, who in the world did this? So I was like, I don't know. It's kind of funny how that all happened. I wasn't home. I was at school. That's, that's really so funny. he, so he, so everybody's wondering at this time because it's Christmas time. They go, when in the world did you have time <laughs> to pull this off when everybody doesn't go to bed until like three, four o'clock in the morning, right when you're about to go to school or work? How wait? No, I tell you, I'll give it away. Is that um? What's your secret here, Sean? <laughs> I grabbed a, a sleeping bag, my dad's Marine Corps sleeping yeah. bag. Yeah. Stuffed it all in there. Left the room to myself. Folded, unfolded everything. Took everything out. Yeah. Made sure no one uh, came into my room. Just started taping, taping, wrapping, wrapping. He. Jesus. At one he point, went to work just for at the one sake point, of burning him. At one point, he got That's so... Dedication. P- That's dedication. That's oh, dedication right there. Wait. Yeah. After one point, I end up ruining his DVDs. How did I do this? Well, when you're messing with Gorilla Glow, and you kind of go overboard, and you kind of don't realize that you spilled the DVD to the case, and the only thing you can do is to break the DVD to get it out of the case, you know you're in trouble. Oh, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so that's what I did. I broke it. And that was the gift you uh, you had for him there? Oh, no. That wasn't what I wanted to do. Oh, okay. That was one of the gifts that I said, 
don't mess with me ever again. Yeah, definitely. No, yeah, I think you definitely set that yeah. set that bar for him there. Well, because my other idea was would have been like having to my friend at Bishop Stang. I don't know sure if he's going to be listening to this, but I pulled this kid off so bad. He wanted to mess with me. He wouldn't give it up. I said, okay. Found out where this kid parks. Took his tire, made him go around the school like four or five times. Wait, so lo- you took his tire off his car? I took his tire off his car. The, wow. whole, the whole time, his tire was actually in the back of his trunk. Wow. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, he's all looking for it. God. Walking around the school. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't think we've ever... We're not too big of pranksters, to be honest. Yeah. I don't think, you know, maybe... It takes a lot of work. We're not We're not as passionate as Yeah, we. I'm hip, definitely. Yeah. It, it just, it's, it's nothing about passion. It's, it's just that what, what, what you can create. The creativity. To, I was create, just say. Yep, yep. to, to the creativity of a comedian. Yeah. And that's what I am. I'm a comedian off the air. I make people laugh and... Sometimes people don't get to see my co- my comedy at all, and I kind of feel bad because most of the time, especially when I'm doing filming for you guys, filming for anybody, I don't have time or the credibility to give you any type of jokes or a smile on your yeah, face. Yeah, definitely. Because at the time, you're it's just... It's all work, yeah. It's an interviewing it, it, process. It, 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 it's not an interviewing process. It's there for business. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Your business equity comes first, when, especially when you're trying and to get And, you know, clients. I think definitely there there has to be that separation between the professionalism and the comedy. Like, you know, we're all for, like, a good time and jokes, but even I feel like this rehearsal process, especially for being such a powerful and tough show... Yeah was very serious, and there wasn't a lot of time for laughs this uh, this time around, where, you know, in other productions, we can be goofy, you know, kind of singing more and stuff, but I feel like, uh, I don't know about you, I feel like this production was a lot of just yeah. to the point in work, and especially for your character, you had a lot of lines exactly, going there, yeah. so that must have been, how was that process like? I mean, we, we, we talked about... Uh, like that back and forth banter kind of, you know yeah, what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, we talked about our normal, uh, normal way to maintain a happy rehearsal space, and that was... Uh, singing and bringing our instruments and having a good time and I mean I'm not saying this rehearsal process wasn't a good time it was one of the best rehearsal processes I've ever had but it was just different in 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 the fact that it was it was a lot more let's let's bring light to something that happened here and let's let's move forward with this especially with a character like Brad with all those Run on sentences of news reporting and whatnot. Like doing a musical, something you know, you just put you put it on a good show for people to enjoy, have a good time. But doing something where you're trying to um, trying to really set set an image for people and really uh, you know bring this to the forefront. I think that's its own beast of a art project. Mike, I have a question for you. Yeah, what's up? Whose idea was it to come up? With America's funniest videos for boneheads. Um, yeah, actually, so um, that was all included in the script that was written by uh, I believe her name's Kristen um, Kristen Adele Calhoun. Calhoun. Okay. Calhoun. Yep. And um, the character I, I researched, um, it's actually based off of Bob Saget. Yeah, I, I noticed. Yep. I, I learned. I always knew Tom Bergeron as the host of America's Funniest Home Videos, yeah. you know, but, but Bob, Bob Saget, Saget, I guess, back there. in the day was the yes, original host. Yes, he, um, he, he was. He they was actually, actually, they had a Bonehead special, uh, which we used the exact same intro for, the heads to salute bones, and then it messes up, and it's like, wait a minute, like, <laughs> and fixes itself there. That was all real live footage from America's Home Funniest Home Videos at the time. And then uh, we cut it back, Palmer introduced Rob Taggett, and then we took our own spin on it. And I really think the, uh, you know, that was a, it was supposed to be, you know, a funny scene to detract from uh, the seriousness of the rest of the play. And, you know, Rob Taggett is definitely a racist character. He's laughing at videos of uh, African Americans getting shot and stuff. So it's, it's definitely a messed up scene, but I think it's supposed to represent kind of America's blindness to uh, this kind of stuff. Like, you're scrolling through Facebook all the time, and you see videos like this, and, you know, you see the comments, and people are that brutal, you know? So I think these kind of things do happen in real life, and, you know, my portrayal was definitely a wacky. I got inspiration, uh, you know, Robert De Niro's character in the Joker, Murray Franklin? Don't think I've seen that. Okay, yeah. Well, you know, just kind of like that wacky, like, yeah, kind of yeah, picture totally. in the 80s, kind of just like larger than life. The yeah. like, whoa kind of guy, you know? <laughs> you know, but definitely, I think at the root of it, that's a very serious, 
serious character and one of the one of the worst right up there with Aaron Wilson for, you know, laughing about these serious yeah. things. I think I only played one uh redeemable character in the whole play. I had five characters and um the last one I played was a librarian uh, under the name of uh, Scott Bonner. He uh Scott Bonner. Yeah. He's the only uh uh white person in the play who actually is like doing something in terms of the city of Ferguson. Uh, these are cool. the guys who I told to listen. Yeah, I don't. I'm not sure if the calls are accepting. Uh, I don't know. Is it all? I don't know, dude. I'm hoping. Cause the show is still continuing. Mm-mm-mm. Sorry, guys, but because the show is still continuing. Now, Palmer, are there any uh, theater shows like that you uh, are just eyeing to do in the in your future? Uh, any musicals or anything that draw inspiration? Uh, I mean, there's a lot of classics, oh, radar, you, know, you know, we're, 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 uh, we're definitely not, uh, we haven't built up a, a, a massive resume or anything, nah. so, uh, definitely so many things that, that we could do and try and branch out to, but, uh, in, uh, our most recent class here at, uh, Bristol Community College, we took, uh, voice, movement, and style, it was a 200-level acting class with David Ledoux, and it was honestly a huge learning experience for me and uh for our final we were supposed to pick a classic play from a list of playwrights and one of those was eugene uh ionesco and we picked his play called rhinoceros and it's uh actually out of the uh absurdism movement in the like 30s and 40s and it's a really interesting play that we got to do a climactic scene from and just doing that scene made me like really really want to do that play so hopefully i get a chance to do that maybe yeah, rhinoceros my... definitely on the radar uh in terms of musicals uh i would definitely little shop of horrors would definitely oh, be on yeah. the radar I'm a big fan the, of that um, i'd love to play the dentist someday yeah definitely. that would be wonderful how about playing my killer my killer i've never heard of my I have no 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 uh what you guys don't know is i'm sir i'm Pretty certain some of my audience do remember uh, from Andrew being on the show was we was talking about crime on my last show and a lot of people knew about my head injury mm-hmm. where I was out uh, I just my grandfather just died in 2005 I just moved out of my safe neighborhood out in 2006 okay. went down to Whitman near North Front now if you're from New Bedford you all know where North Front is which is a tough tough area that's where you have mostly all different type of gang members right living in that one area wow. yep. and I was down in Riverside Skate Park about 9 or 10 o'clock at night I just came back from a fishing trip, and some punk kid ended up telling me to run my pockets. And I said no. I wanted to hit the kid because I had my football in my right hand, which was going to be my knockout hand. I flipped it to my left. I fumbled the ball, went to pick it up. Then I was going to knock him out with my right, and that didn't happen. When you I got to when you were down picking up the ball? Yeah, he... Ah. Four to seven skull fractures. Jesus. A month, a month in the hospital, 30 to 40 staples in my head. And if I shave my head completely, I think, Mike, you've seen some of the scars. I wasn't sure if you had any questions on those scars when you saw them. No, I'm not familiar with them, actually. Maybe I didn't notice. Well, when you shave my head, the scars are yep. still there. I wow. have like three or four, Jeez, uh, two to oh, three scars. That is, that's crazy. That's awful, man. So and, and that was, um, now that you mentioned this, uh, that David Ledo is doing Our Town, because I... Wrote, our Stories uh, is uh, the device piece off of New Bedford. So yeah. I was thinking if I talked to him, would this be a perfect time? Yeah, definitely. We're going to be... Um, to tell yeah, that, to tell that story. Up. We're going to be going him. out and interviewing people soon, so definitely I'll talk to David, and, you know, definitely, we definitely would want to talk to you about that. Yeah. Because the killer is still out there. Wow. They never have. Caught him. They never caught him. Never put anybody in question. And as far as to, as far as I to my knowledge. Yeah. 
But wow, man, that's th- there is. Be hard for you. I could have sworn I saw him once in the the papers during the raid, but the years doesn't match up. So I was like, back to the drawing board again. Yeah, definitely. That that's definitely like a struggle of a thing. You know yeah, what I mean? Nobody's still out there. That, fucking. Yeah. Hasn't been brought to justice yet. Nope. I was 21 at the time, too. Nah, wow. I'm sorry, man. That's, that's it awful. It sucks. You know, people are evil. Uh, they, yeah. Some people freaking will do anything for, for money. There, and, humans you know have I mean? a part of them that can be accessed through environment or God knows what that just... But you know something? I proved them wrong that I was actually still here, still doing videos. Yeah, exactly. And, 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 that's the cool thing. God bless you. Know I mean? dude, is mainly what it comes down to is that you're still here. You haven't let that event get to you. You're still being kind and virtuous. You're not giving in to the rage. Yeah, definitely. You see a lot of it, like, every day. Like, people just kind of treating each other kind of crappy. And, like, you just got to take back from it and just be like, why? You know what I mean? Like, yeah, yeah, you, like you, you should you always ha- just try to, like, to. uplift people. How you know what I mean? Yeah. For, you know what I mean? Exactly. What, do we wanna, what kind of energy do we want to leave in the space that we live in? Not there's no need. There's no need to be, like, shitty towards somebody. Excuse my French. You know what I mean? Like, Well, Mike, you actually um, make good points. But I also got another good point that just happened recently I now that I think about it, there was a really, really bad accident where this lady was coming off the other direction of 495, um, not 495, 95, yep. from Dartmouth. She was going into New Bedford. Okay, 195 east over there, yeah. She ended up losing control of her car, flips her car, lands on the highway, a split of a second... Like all it takes is a split of a second for another car. Oh yeah, for, for, you know for, life is so yeah. fragile. But but, but here's that. here's the deal. What actually shocks me the most is that all these other cars that's in front of me were starting to slow down, and I'm just like, why are these cars slowing down? Yeah. They must have saw something I'm not seeing. But in a quarter of my eye, I said, why is that car? Where where's that car think it's gonna do? It's it literally jumped over the. Godwell wires. Jesus. And Jesus. I was just like, whoa. Well, and it landed on its side. You want to know something and I hit, thought about and, the other day? And his the funny thing is, coincidentally, the lady ended up walking out of the car before the emergency vehicles even get there. Jeez. She was all right, yeah. She so was she was, okay. I don't know why oh. or how this is possible, but her windshield smashed. She yeah. just destroyed her sunroof. To her, to her SUV. Because the car flipped, right? Because the car Jesus. flipped on its side. It didn't even do a 360. It just flat nah. on its side. And here's this lady just coming up with minor mine, mine cuts on both her hands. I'm saying, where's well, the rest of the glass? You know, life is so, like, free, so fragile. So, and then you think all the time, like, you can be caught in that traffic there. And then you're just like, you know, you're in a pissy mood because you're caught in traffic. But then you can realize, like, what you know, the people, like, in the accident are going through. You know what exactly. I mean? Like, and people are so, like, I feel like in their own, like, individual worlds, we all just kind of got to get on the same page Put more. yourself in their shoes. I mean, if I if I was ever in an accident or my car dies while I'm in traffic, people are driving past me beeping, like, hey, freaking, you know what I mean, jerk, like, get off the road. <laughs> you know, and I'm in that place. I'm like, what is going through but, this guy's yeah, head? Does he think I can just, alive, like, yeah. teleport my car out of here? Like, I'm going through a lot more stress than you are right now. Because like, you're, you're worried about your car. car. But then I'm in the same situation, and I'm driving past someone, and I'm like, hey, get out of the road, jerk. Well, I think you know, you know one, I mean? one of the things we were talking about the other day yeah, is, like, about just things. the concept of road rage as a general. Yeah. It's like, how do people actually get out of their cars and just beat someone up over freaking, yeah. over traffic? Like, you know what I mean? We'll, it's just like, like, simulate road rage. We'll be, like, driving past each other. You know, we're actors. We love to do stuff like this. <laughs> just, like, hey, jerk, like, well, come on, let's, let's fight. <laughs> <laughs> and and so uh, and we we pull over and then we we think about it. We're like, how do you you get out of the seat of your car? Because you know, what I mean, going from sitting in your car to getting out on the side of the highway, it's a completely Stokes different feeling. It's, yeah, it's, 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 like, it's a complete. It's, it's completely different. Pure adrenaline. I feel in the moment. It, it, you know? it, it, Keep that rage from being behind the steering wheel and being like, "Hey, inconvenience me by like fifteen, maybe like seven seconds. Like I'm gonna go like possibly put him in the hospital. Like it's awful. Yeah, literally. See, I can't." In my experiences with my car breaking down, I can't be that asshole anymore. And I mean by asshole is that I can't be that person who would ignore 
a car that's on the side of the road. I'm sorry, I have to help you. Mm-hmm. I have to pull over. I have to ask you if you're all set, if you're okay. But now I got, or I keep on thinking to myself, and I hate doing it, is I got to keep on putting my jumper box in my car. Yep. Yeah, because yeah. most cars break down because of a dead battery. Yeah, exactly. And I don't have jumpers. <laughs> so I'm like, so I'll be sitting there trying to help the guy out. I'm just like, dude, I can't help you because I don't have jumpers. I was hoping that you did. So I'm like, sorry, I can't help you. Yeah, but all, but all I can do jumpers. is stay on, on, all I can do is stay until so the help arrives yep. or that someone someone else comes by with jumpers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely good to have a – I always keep it back in the, the pack in the back of my truck with some jumpers and I have one of those – batteries that like you can just charge and it has jumper cables attached comes in handy yeah it does uh, i used to live by that and used to charge it up all the time in my car now i forget to do it because of space because of can you hear yeah i think you're, i'm good, good? yeah having some technical difficulties <laughs> i'm all set though wait uh, you need to press this to cue the phone I don't know. But I know if I don't do this, so I can. Maybe that might be why. <laughs> uh, sorry for the listeners. I hope that, you know, the music wasn't playing as we was talking. Oops, forgot about that part. <laughs> <laughs> we'll find out when we listen. Yeah, right. Yeah, that maybe that might have not worked out. Maybe that's probably the reason why. Who knows? Maybe that might have just ruined the whole entire show, but it didn't ruin my TV show. Ha ha. Ha uh-huh. <laughs> So, yes, this is also going to be on TV, by the way. Oh, oh nice. yeah, I didn't know that. So, yeah, so, I should have looked at you more. Than <laughs> Damn, I'm out here. I thought we were doing like a radio show. I'm yeah. out here podcasting. But, I but it is, it's, that's what a podcast is. It's yeah. actually a radio talk show. Yeah. Oh, okay. But it's also a TV. That's it's why kind of crossing the media. Yeah. 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 I'm a big fan of uh, Joe Rogan. Yeah, I've been listening to a lot of him. Him and uh, I, did, I listened to the full him and Paul Stamets. I'm the, uh, okay, okay. Big fan of Paul Stamets, yeah. No, did you guys see the um the new not the new guy but he's actually a new comedian that's coming out of New York. His name is Vic. I'm not familiar. He's not familiar. He, he's a Yankee fan and some of his work he's actually on YouTube. Uh he's got some quite some funny YouTube videos. Huh. He's also I think last year or the year before yeah. he had a um a toy of Mr. Snow from the cartoon of, uh, trying to think the cartoon, where Santa takes off a year or something like that. Oh, yeah. A year yeah, without Santa yeah, Claus? Yeah. 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 He's got that in his hand, and he goes, hey, you, enough with the snow. Yeah. No more snow. Yeah. You get favorite, out of here or I'll punch you in the face. One of my favorite Christmas uh, songs, definitely the Miser Brothers Christmas song. Yeah, that's... I'm Mr. White right? Christmas. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's what it was. And I was like, wow, this dude is really that funny. Yeah, no, uh, and, and I was just like, okay. And my dad's... That was actually one of my dad's idol. Well, so that's one of my dad's favorite com- comedy guys. Besides, next to Jeff Dunham. Jeff Dunham's pretty funny. I would say, um, I don't know, yeah, I'm a big fan of, um, I don't even know, like Dave Chappelle's pretty up there, I'd say, Dave for Dave Chappelle, Louis C.K. is really funny. Dave, Dave I'm Chappelle, a big fan of Whitest Kid You Know, I would Dave, say. Dave Chappelle is, is stopped. I don't know why. Yeah, 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 he retired. Yeah, uh, he, but he still does his private shows coming around, but he stopped doing comedy skits for, for TV. Damn. He still he still has his own, like I think he's coming to Fox Woods. Don't quote me, or right, that he already came and left. But I think he's coming sometime either April or May. Oh, cool! Or that he already came, like oh, I said. Okay. So yeah, yeah. so they were advertising that, and I that sucks. I, I get all the emails from Fox Woods because I go there up a lot. Yeah. So uh, Gilbert Gottfried's great. I Gilbert really Godfrey's I mean our, one of my our biggest influences by far is the. Uh, the sketch group led by Trevor Moore, known as the Whitest Kids You Know, they were on IFC. They were a huge influence for us, and we we have like all their skits memorized. But uh, 
Also, Good Neighbor Stuff with Kyle Mooney. He writes for SNL okay. now. Yeah, he's uh, also a huge inspiration. I like the Portuguese kids. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm not, uh, uh, yeah, I'm not, yeah, yeah. One of them just Portuguese. got arrested recently, yes. correct? Yeah, that's crazy. But, yeah. but um, one of them ah, did get arrested. But the coffee again. Oh, come on, buddy. Was it... Did he really spill... Was it empty or is it full this no, time? No, I mean, it's still a little full, but... Nothing we can't handle over here. Nothing we can't manage. This uh, podcast is brought to you by Paper Towels. <laughs> paper Towels. <laughs> Remember to only use paper towels when you're in an immediate situation where you need to wipe something up that might be coffee. <laughs> so I'm wondering if now, if we're going to get any phone calls oh, I think coming I in. On that again, maybe. All right, are, are our phone calls Wait. on the line? Uh-oh. Uh... Let's see what happened. Uh, testing, testing. Okay. Yeah, I, I think we're good. I, yeah. I guess we're still good. Okay. All right. Yeah, I, somehow I shrunk when that happened. Some hiccups. No, what, no. Kind of, what kind of grunge you got on here? Yeah, I see like a well, stone from some, Audio Slate. Let's That's a big, discuss some big grunge. What do you mean by grunge? I'm a big grunge guy. I love, I love 90s rock. I love 90s music. I love uh, Pearl Jam, Smashing Pumpkins, Nirvana, Making Alice in Chains. Lincoln Park, yeah, that's a little more 2000s era, more electronic. It's still 90s. Uh, yeah, 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 but it's it, more it is. late. Yeah. It's still 90s because they're CD. Lincoln Park is, is, is actually would be described as being a part of the post-grunge era. You know, post-grunge was like Puddle of Mud. Some Radiohead is still technically kind of grunge, but still more post-grunge. Incubus, all those are definitely post-grunge bands. What do you mean by that? That's still '90s though. That came out in the '90s. No, yeah, yeah, it's '90s, but it's more. It's a different sound. It's more. It's less like bare bones, like blues-based rock. It's more like leaning towards electronic pop. You mean electronic rock? Yeah, yeah, pop rock. Yeah, yeah like a group like pop Evanescence. Yeah, 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 yeah like exactly. Yeah. Where it's like they fuse the two. You know what I mean? With the progression. I, I think use. that makes. I think that makes it sound better. No, I said you. Yeah, no, it's, oh, it yeah, all definitely. depends on it's what you like It's all different art form, to. you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. So, I don't know what I have on here, but I definitely know. Yeah, I see Big Time Rush over there, even. So. Oh, some Big Time Rush. Halfway there. You know, you know, Big Time Rush, actually, uh, I think... I think they were a pretty good, uh, pretty yeah. good group back in the day. Yeah, they definitely influenced. I don't us, know what they're doing know. now, but you know, Gustavo I think... Rock, I'd say definitely influenced. I, I don't know what. I, in the room. See, here's the deal: some of these rocks, um, rock bands that were on TV, that come in and out, yeah. They they have their own TV show, like the Naked Brothers Band. I'm not even sure if they're still around. Okay. But what happens to them when they disappear? What happens yeah. when their show gets canceled? Oh, that's true. Uh, yeah. uh, are they still even... Doing tours, yeah. I believe yeah. Big Time Rush, I actually, a lot of them act now. I was going to say, I just saw my uh, my grandmother watches a lot of the Lifetime movies. I saw the one who plays, uh, uh, is it Kendall? Uh, not Kendall, James, James. James, oh yeah. James yeah, yeah, yeah. was in um one of, a, one of the big Lifetime movies that they were doing, and he was like one of the leads in that. So, I mean, I think it was pretty cool seeing him still like relevant and around. You know what I mean? I got you. They were good kids, so. But... Still, like, if you're going to make music your inspiration, like, for example, Godsmack. Yeah. Godsmack has been around since the 90s. I think, I think, I think, I think, like, I think, like, 92. And to still see that band still, still do a tour around the United States, they are influenced because the people are still listening to them, they still bring out powerful, powerful messages where, yes, I know someone's going to call me, Eric, Andrade. I know you're going to call me on this, but please, I would love to at least get one phone call, if not. I, I don't um, think the calls are open. I think there's something, because I, I think uh, one of our listeners has been trying to call. Really? Yeah. Uh, let's try it again. Hit the queue, see what happens. That just cut my audio. Yeah, okay, my audio just okay. got cut too. So I'll hit. Uh, where's the phone? Da, 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 da. How's that? Yeah, maybe now because the red light's on. Maybe. Let's let's try it. Let's see. The phone number is five zero eight 
508-730-3272. So right now we're waiting on some callers to come in. Oh, definitely, yeah. Maybe, hopefully we get lucky. Let's go. Let's, uh... I'm a big, uh, going back to music, uh, I'd say one of my one, number one favorites is easily Tom Petty. Oh, big Tom, Tom Petty. Petty guy. Sucks. Sucks that we lost him recently. Wait a minute. Tom Petty, the NASCAR driver? No, no. no. Tom Petty, the uh, the very famous rock yeah. uh, rock star. Don't know him. No? I, you don't know Tom Petty? Yeah. I, I just I just know I just know Tom Petty. The Mary Jane's race. Last Dance. Um, what's another famous one? Um, Refugee. Let's see what else he's got. Uh, don't Come Around Here No More. Man, don't do me like that. Let's see. Don't do me like that. Oh, that's Tom Petty? Yeah, yeah that's Tom Petty. Yeah, easily. Last dance with Mary baby. Jane. One really? I didn't know that was Tom Petty. I just learned something new. Wow, 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 wow. All right, the phone number is 508-730-3272. Hopefully we get some of you listeners out there to give us a call. All right, definitely. It looks like the phone's open now. See what happens. Now that our music might be all set now. Yeah, the music is done. Um, I don't see any way that this is not going to work. Yeah. I mean, I thought of everything. I learned everything yeah. about this podcast. and You know, going back to what we were initially talking about, it was Canfield Drive. I think uh, one of the cool things about Canfield Drive was the un- unique way it kind of had like a lot of videos yeah. in with the... Uh, the show, you know what I mean? Yes. That was cool. That, uh, that was whose, different. whose idea was that? It's written into the script, I believe. Yeah. But um, I, I really should know his last name. Sean. He, um, Sean Elliott. Sean, Sean Elliott. Elliott. He does yeah, everything right, around nice. here. He does the set. He does He does the workshop. He's been around since Ryland Brenner. And he um, he was the one who went and spliced everything with the help of uh, Don Mays, the director. They worked on that together. They put up the projectors and everything like that. And uh, Matthew Paquin did the uh, lights. He's also a teacher. He teaches uh, stagecraft over at BCC. So. Yeah, definitely a re- really good crew to help us out. No, nah, definitely. With Everyone's very art. friendly, helpful with each other. I mean, like, even the set, like, they painted the floor, made it look like the street. Yeah, that, you know I, I, mean? was, I was amazed by that. I really thought I was actually yeah. going to be walking on the street, and I was like... Actors brought it. Yeah, they like, literally... Like, they, like, they, like they, literally... They, they made the crack ceiling look so good, you know what I mean? Like, I really thought I was actually going to be walking on the street, and I was like... Where's the tape? How, how did you guys get this in here? Wow, I'm hip. Yeah, definitely. I, at first, I thought I was walking on um, the linoleum. Is that how you say it? Linoleum, yeah. 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 And I, I was just like, okay, cool. So we're still waiting on calls. Yeah, I, I, I still don't think the calls are working, honestly. Well, because we, uh, we would have a caller if it was. You can always uh, text text um, or email because the email is srichard21 at bristolcc.edu. I will will post the question uh, since I have my phone with me. You listeners don't know that, but I have my phone on me right now. And if uh, you guys got a question, you can send it right down to my email. And then I will let you guys, I will read your question on air. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Or you can text one of these guys if you have their number. Yeah. And they will tell us who it is and what their question is. I'm sorry for the t- um, technical difficulties, but I'm just doing my best mm-hmm. thinking outside the box. So now, Sean, you are... You've been recording show the two p- previous shows for this season, which were Edgar Allan Poe and uh, Canfield Drive. So you just started this season. Um, are you going to be recording Our Town, which is on the main stage? I don't. That would I, be the first main stage show you recorded, right? That would be my my first for BCC, but my second. Oh, uh, what well, one did you record? I recorded one when it was uh, for Ben Gilberg. And it was at UMass. Oh, okay, yeah, UMass I, I performed on the UMass theater. I did, um, but it wasn't a performance. It was more of a show that he that he had us that he did with Mitchell Gardner, 
Um, I think it's not ICP, but uh, I'm trying to think. I think it's KCP or something like that. I'm not sure. Yeah. No, UMass has a gorgeous theater. But yeah. um, but anyway, getting back to that, they he had many performers. Oh, okay. So it was like a so 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 it was like a collaboration, more like um, more like a concert, more okay. to say. And I recorded that for him, and uh, and that was at UMass. So I was kind of happy with that. But fortunately, what happens to a video producer? Videos get lost. Yeah, video lost. the information somehow gets Slips destroyed or or uh gets accidentally deleted and when you're doing live theater any live thing like that you can only record it once you know what i mean so correct it's gone yeah and, and it's and it's gone that's uh, and, right. and if you missed your opportunity well, i recall you uh you even came to one of our dress rehearsals to get some early footage yeah uh was that just in case was that like a safety precaution now based off of no, that was for me to get used to the equipment that I was and, using. And, like, the show, yeah. Like what and you're... what to expect. And also for one other reason is for better camera angles. Oh, okay, yep. Definitely so that was sense. that was my one-time chance. And that's the reason why I do rehearsals because I get to see and use bloopers. And so I can say, hey, this kid messed up. How would you yeah, like to Yeah, when they cut it and everything. Uh, no, I'm not uh, sure if our uh, mic is uh, on over there. I'm not seeing anything move. Yeah, uh, I'm seeing them moving on this side. Okay, where, where we got the where we can hear each other. So, okay, I, so I, I know so I know our listeners are got to be listening. Testing. We are but, on the radio, s- but still, um, how you guys looking for viewers? Uh, you guys got any touch with any of them? If they can still hear us or not, or they uh, give up. I haven't even checked my phone in a bit. I threw it to the side. I believe <laughs> one of our uh, one of the people who was interested is was trying to call in earlier. I'm not sure if they're still tuned in. Uh, okay, uh, you want to get in touch with them and see what they got, or you tried doing that already? Uh, I can uh, I can try to have them call. I'm not sure. Or even ask a question of your phone. It doesn't matter. Just let us know who the person is, so that we we can give them credit. All right. Uh, let's see. And I'm gonna do the same. See if I can reach out to. This is uh, David Back Dian. Okay. Uh, he's a, a good friend of ours. He uh, goes to Michigan, and uh, he uh, he was actually had the pleasure of coming in and watching our show, and uh, he was just wondering how we synced up all the light cues and and the sound and whatnot. I think that's gonna be a. Uh... Sean question. Exactly. Sean, 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 Sean Elliott. I don't know how they do it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I don't know. That's either a Rebecca. A bit of it in uh, Stagecraft. They, um, he, Matt, our light director, can actually do it from his eye watch, which is really interesting. Wow. And the fact that, uh, you know, he has the grid, and then they translate that grid, so it's all linked up to his computer. And, like, if you saw, like, when we were doing the cop lights, their LEDs fading from blue to red, you could see that transition on his computer, so he syn- synced it up. And then how light cues work, they go in the script and, like, you do certain scenes. Whenever there's a cue, you mark it and then uh, you, you beat it. So that's cue one. And then you'd set whatever cue one is, kind of. And then, so it's kind of, it's almost like a, um, just like an algorithm type. I'm going to try doing something, see if I can get uh, at least a call. call. Yeah, I'm going to test this. What's the number? 732? 730. 3272. Let's see what happens. Yeah, but basically the process consists of a lot of stopping and starting and going back, and so we can re- really align those things. It's up. ringing. You're getting a ring. I'm getting a ring. Yeah, we're getting nothing over here. Hello. No. What about phone? Phone two, maybe. Uh, or that button up top, maybe? My other friend says it's just not answering. It just goes. I'm trying, yeah. I'm trying to figure this out. No, it ain't working. Um. Hello? I'm the 
was trying right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right what about those red buttons up top there? Uh, I don't know. Oh, that's my voice. No, nope. <laughs> uh, I got nothing. Just keeps on ringing. I'm sorry, guys. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm sorry. Hey, I'm trying, man. I'm really trying. <laughs> Gotta get used to the space. May maybe, uh, maybe Steve can teach us how to answer calls. Cause, as far as what I learned, is that this damn stupid chip <laughs> likes to sink on me and doesn't want to walk in. No, like uh, I was saying, s s thanks to Steve for F um, FRC Radio. I mean, the FRC TV media, he knows how to hook everything up. And so that's what I'm hoping on right now. Yeah. So. One of um, one of the uh, shows, I think uh, comparing the stages of UMass Dartmouth and uh, BCC, because I've performed on both, I honestly think Bristol has a much nicer space, you know. Their their stage actually has the ability to move, you know, and get access to the basement mm -hmm. to fly things in and out, you know, and that's very unique. I feel. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I actually, I, I, I agree. I've been to, I've been to both. I've watched you, uh, watched you perform uh, Beauty and the Beast there. Uh, that was pretty, yeah. pretty interesting. But yeah, I have to say, Midsummer on the proscenium here was just wonderful like all the stuff you yeah, can do I had the pleasure of playing uh, Demetrius in that and yeah. I actually remember back in uh, when we were earlier discussing the high school theater arts class we take we mm -hmm. did uh, Midsummer and uh, I remember portraying uh, Lysander back then so I think it was yeah. pretty interesting to go back and flip it Look and play the Demetrius characters, yeah. exactly yeah I mean we also did uh, we did a prof we did a, a version of A Christmas Carol with uh, on stage theater productions and that was at the BCC Theater, which was awesome, you know, being able to do a large-scale musical like that on yeah. such a wonderful stage. Definitely. Playing uh, Scrooge and Marley, respectively, of the past was pretty cool. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and then having, like, adult actors actually come in and playing Yeah, that, the that was interesting. Yeah. Older versions of us was very interesting. Yeah, kind of matched their height and everything, so. Yep. So... Um, I'm still wondering if we still got listeners. I'm hoping that we still do. Um, yeah, there's no way to like track it or anything. There, there's or there's anything. nothing. Yeah. On, I don't know. Uh, it's no biggie, man. You just gotta have faith. So I'm hoping that we got listeners. So I'm still wondering if there's any more questions out there. Um, yeah, I mean, please, do you have any questions for us? Yeah. My questions to you guys is how difficult was it to play in Canfield Drive? I'm not sure if I asked this question already, but to keep it from personal, did you guys get mad at your characters that you guys were chosen to pick? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Uh, Jeff Smith was uh, not, well, not too difficult, but, I mean, it required a, a huge raise of energy. And, I mean, in the scene I did... I go right from playing Brad O'Connor, who's like this, you know what I mean, very like straight up and down, like to the point uh, Republican who doesn't really think about outside stuff, to being a kind of compassionate, sensitive, nerdy kind of guy that Jeff Smith was. And I, I feel like doing that transition in a matter of seconds, pretty much just walking to the corner of the room, doing my little change, grabbing my book, and then becoming a whole different person was definitely frustrating throughout the process, but I feel like the end result was was uh, gratifying. Yeah, I think uh, one of the biggest things definitely was just throughout the whole process was keeping that open mind of, yeah. you know, I think any, yeah. you know, no matter where you fall on the political spectrum, like I know I'm pretty Republican uh, compared to the average person, but for, I think no matter what, you know, coming in with an open mind, anything can be a learning experience. Yeah. And I think you got to realize that no matter what your personal views are, as long as you can take in the views of another person, yeah. I think, you know, you can learn a lot from that. And, you know, listening, listening to anything from like NPR to, you know, CNN News to, uh, you know, even Canfield Drive, it had a lot of stuff that... You know, some people may not agree with, but I think at least, you know, hearing and respecting it. Yeah, it's a heavy topic at the end of the day. You know, the loss of a life is just... Definitely. Is and I think at the end of the day, that's what this is about, was it's kind of keeping yeah. his, like, his legacy. Making sure we don't forget the name Mike Brown. Yeah. Michael Brown, 
God bless him. 2014. See, his um, my point on the play is that how much lack of information it hold. It, it mainly pointed to the white people who owned slaves. It really wasn't that. It was mainly the United, the United States originally had one-third of Spanish people who actually lived here before the Indians did. Mm. And that's a big, and, and, and that's a big, big topic. And when you mention that, you're actually like looking, hey, wait a minute. Did the white people actually own slaves, or is it the Spanish people themselves who are the slave traders? Yeah, yeah well, I mean, uh, at the end of the day, slavery is, is something that was practiced by like so many cultures and whatnot and whether you're Spanish or you know what I mean or an English settler in America or not you're still you still have white skin and you still get experience the privilege of being a white person and and not being judged right when people look at you in America you know that, that's that's fair to say I really think you know because like whether they were Spanish or not those people they're uh, what their ancestors led to are, are your daily white Americans, you know? So I, I still feel like that crosses over to today's issues. It still does. Yeah. It, there, there's no change in that. Yeah. And it, and it has the worst part is that we still create it. Yeah. 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 And yeah. how do we today put a stop to it? And yeah, exactly. You know, I think, I think, you know, there are no easy answers to that, but I think, you know, doing theater that um, that informs on that is definitely a nice start. Yeah, I feel like a, a lot of like what this play is trying to talk about, and a lot of what Brad is doing in this play that Imani is so desperate to try to put an end to as soon as she can, is this carrying over of these thoughts and ideals to newer generations and whatnot. I believe Imani's exact line was, uh, "You're poisoning an entire generation of children, even your own." And I think that was was heavy because I feel like that that points to uh, what's blocking the solution to this, which is guiding new generations into the world with ideals that are different from the ones that we began with. That's fair to say. Uh, rest in peace, Michael Brown. Yeah, um, Michael Lowland, the steering. There's there's also other people that we could say rest in peace too but it's it's just countless and you mentioned them throughout the play it really is ridiculous how many names there are I think this play really pays tribute to every single one of them you know what I mean yep I mean you could make a play about every single one yeah but it goes deeper than than just one and it just goes deeper than just one community I I mean, mean I think this one this case specifically is just like I mean, I think there there are some lines in the play that just make, like one of one of Brad's lines where he argues uh, the immediate reaction to Mike Brown's death, and I believe the line is the shooting happened on a Saturday. The county examiner and police department had a skeleton crew on duty. They wished they could have moved faster, but they were just following protocol, and uh, that's in response to his body laying in the street uncovered for four hours. Like that's like. Ferguson is a small town. How how much time do you think it takes to get across a small town? Uh, depends on the small town. It's is it small like, like Bedford or is it small? Like, is it like thirty minutes maximum? Like I said, is it small like? Let's just say, for example, town. like Dartmouth to Dartmouth. You know, South Dartmouth to North Dartmouth. But what I'm trying, pro- the point pro- I'm trying pro- to make is if, if, way, I, if I have to, if I had to, to go town. all around Dartmouth. It would probably take me an hour and a half. Okay. Compared to a questionnaire, it takes you about 30 minutes. Yeah. That's what I mean by small town. Like, how small mm-hmm. are you are you looking at But it? you're also looking at, too, just, like, the urgency of a police force, too. You know, definitely there was some wrongdoing on there. Part uh, in that. Oh, yeah, there's definitely... I'm not saying that there isn't wrong, any wrong on that, but you're asking... Well, how, how much space do I? How much? How small is a town? Is yeah, as small as a no, town. No, yeah, and still, like, it, 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 however it, long, four hours is still. Well, like, yeah, crazy. that's what I'm saying. Even if they had a skeleton crew, we could on get duty, to. I don't care if we could get had, to New but, York and back in four hours from yeah, here. Yeah, you know exactly. what I mean? Like or, that's or, like or, or, crazy. Or from here to New Hampshire. Yeah, literally, you can go to interstate 
probably crossed through three states in the time that yeah. they could couldn't even put a cloth over his you know dead body, which I think kind of sucks. Yeah, exactly. Like back to the point I was trying to make. Like it, they're saying it, it, they had a skeleton crew on duty, so it justifies them leaving a body out in the street for four hours when like. It probably takes you 20 minutes to drive across and, Ferguson tops. And I don't know much, too, but I'm pretty sure, like, one of the first things you're supposed to do in, like, a crime scene is, like, cover the body. Yeah, you know what exactly. I mean? Like That so, is. I don't that know is, how that, that procedure was, like, so mixed. The body might have been covered for part of the time, but either way, the sheet didn't cover his entire body, so part of him was exposed, and he was still just laying on the street for four hours. Terrible. Either way, that's awful. Like, in the sun of Missouri, like, that's a human being. Like, now, before you guys did this play... Um, and with all the information that you gathered, does your, does your outlook change at all compared to what was taught to us, what was told to us in the, by the media? Um, I mean, I'm not sure if it's as much as my opinion changed because I always thought it was tragic and everything. I think definitely I not put myself in the shoes more, but I know more about the topic you know what I, mean? I feel I, I learned a lot about exactly like what happened where the issues were the red flags went up and everything like that and definitely can use that information in the future when I, these cases happen I definitely learned a lot about the actual incident and how like outrageous it actually was and like for me it really like I, I wish I was more informed when it was happening when I was a lot younger uh, but uh, like during it, I can see why it sparked such outrage right. and people were so angry about it, you know, and it's just like, it's crazy. Do you think if this person was white, do you think it would have changed the outcome or do you think it would still, still had the same outcome? Totally. In my opinion. Yeah. I think, I think, yeah, I think the biggest thing there is still that body laying in the street for four hours. Well, well I'm, I'm just saying if I Michael Brown, have ever what, what I'm trying place. to say is I, I'm agree. saying is if Michael Brown was white, do you think it would still have the same outcome as him by laying in the street for four hours, or do you think that he would have been wrapped up a lot quicker? Uh, no, I, I think that uh, I think that the whole situation would have gone down differently if he was white. It would have been more of like a, you know, if he if he saw a white kid walking, he wouldn't have suspected him for being suspicious because you know what I mean. He's a white kid in a black neighborhood, though. Criminality. Yeah. You you would think. That wouldn't be suspicious. A white kid in a bl- in a black neighborhood? Not necessarily. I mean, it, like people, the officers don't tend to associate suspicion with white people. Depends on the co- depends on the officer. It depends on the officer. Yeah, but uh, I mean, taken from most Missouri officers, like Darren w- Wilson. What's your What's your opinion on that? Yeah, I mean, I kind of I think the situation might have went down completely different. I don't know if anybody would have. You know, I don't know if it would have escalated to the point where it did. I think if I think any time a young person passes away, it's tragic, especially if it's from a police interaction. So I think there would have been outrage there. But I think the race question would have been taken out of it, which completely changes it. Because I think at the end, this as much of a tragedy it became, it also became like a race issue too, and like an example of mistreatment mm-hmm. and inequality. Exactly. Where if it was white on white violence, and we kind of talk about that a little bit in the play, kind of. A lot of white on white violence. Because, you know, you have all these school shootings happen, that's a lot of more white on white violence and everything like that. And there you see a lot of outrage in the media from it, you know? So I think, to answer your question, yes, the media outrage would be the same, but I think the fight would be different. What happens if Darren Wilson was was African-American and and And, uh, Michael Brown was... What happens if it was a switch of a role? I think I think it still would be the exact same outcome. I think there's a lot of um, events like that where um, you draw the line of blue lives matter versus black lives matter, and I believe you know at the end of the day, I think it still would have been the image of a police officer against. Um, yeah, I mean, I I feel like uh, it. Were you, was your question saying that what if Mike Brown was a, a white person? No, you're, yeah, you're saying and what if Darren Wilson was a black? Oh, okay. yeah, I think both yeah. of them were black. No. Okay. No. Oh, I, I, st- I think that uh, I don't think that there would. I still think th- the suspicion maintains the same. I don't think an African American police officer would be more suspicious of a white person than he would a black person. Yeah. I think an African American police officer. It's also like you said. It also always depends on the officer. But we made points in the play that 
even even African American officers hold uh, foster acts of white supremacy and whatnot, and can uh, view black people as being more suspicious than white people, even if that's like their own selves. They still have those same things, and we we went over that in the play. And your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I just I kind of feel I feel the same. I think you really wouldn't. It really wouldn't be as much of an event. I think the the biggest tragedy there is the white on black violence that occurred. And I think if it was flipped in the other way, I think you wouldn't see as much violence about it. But I mean, then again, I don't know how many examples there are in the, like modern history where these things have happened to compare it to. You know what I mean? To say yep. for sure, but because because you don't hear of white people getting killed in Ferguson. Yeah. And you don't get the, those those reports, but you can look those reports up. But is it going to say it? Who's who's to say that it was a, a racist uh, racist crime? Who's there to say it was a racist killing? Mm. It, you wouldn't get those numbers. Yeah, but I mean, uh, in in this in the situation, I mean, it's crazy how a police officer can act on an impulse just because of how somebody looks and do something they... I'm not saying that they would want to do that, but either way, they acted on an impulse that's based on a racist belief, and now because of that, someone's dead. And now after that, they're not going to own up to that. They're just going to use a stereotype to justify what they did, as in that person looking suspicious or making up something incriminating they did, like charging at you or something like that, or reaching for a gun is the biggest Did you one. guys... Um look at any other videos while you guys are doing this play um did you guys do any other videos searching on what actually happened when uh when michael brown was confronted by darren wilson yes i did i i uh i watched uh, a couple other videos some of them was uh one one guy uh he actually, it was him live streaming, and this wasn't uh, this wasn't really a victim case, but it, I thought it was just a really good example of how these things go down. It was a guy hanging out in his car with his friend, and he look, sees a police officer, he's live streaming, and he says, I'm calling it right now, like, this police officer right here is going to pull me over. Like, he shows up the camera, his driver, his registration, shows him everything. He says, like, I guarantee you this co- cop's going to pull me over. Sure as heck, drives past him, wee, 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 gets pulled over, and the officer literally has like nothing on him. He the only reason he could give him for pulling him over was like you passed me and your jaw dropped. Like that, is just, you cannot just like hold up someone's day completely and like pull them over on the side of the road just because their jaw dropped. Like, what if you're late to work or picking your kid up or something? Correct. You know. No, I think it is ridiculous. And uh, one of the cool things, like, I know about, you know, you playing Brad is definitely, like, your views are so different from the character. So yeah, definitely, yeah. how did you, like, go about, like, separating kind of Brad's beliefs from your own? Because you had to, like, almost defend, like, yeah. Darren Wilson's point of view and everything. And, like, you almost were unsupportive of Michael Brown. It was a total, was total character. devil's advocate role. I mean, I just kind of had to use the arguing skills that I already have and use the, you know, I just kind of... I tried to think about, like, almost like a little sister. I tried it with Imani, you know what I mean? Like, how do these reporters like to do? They like to patronize liberals and leftist people. They like to make them seem like the crying little kid who, like, wants something. So I really wanted to use that and try to make, try to do what those kind of people like Brad like to do, which is belittle their opponent and make them seem like their opponent uh, point is based off of nothing. Were you worried at all about, like, the audience's reaction to, to Brad? I mean, a little, definitely, uh, when we found out that uh, Mike Brown Sr. was in the area, but uh, I mean, did he that, actually show up to the no, play? No, they couldn't no, get to be yeah, in New York or schedule conflictions. But like I said about before, I, I at first I was like, oh, but then I I completely reeled that back because then it, I was yeah. like, you know what? Like, we've been we've been putting all this effort into a show that's meant to uh, not let his name be forgotten Respect and, and son, promote yeah. these things. So either way, if I'm playing the antagonist who's saying a lot of these awful things, all in all, it's it's Still, it's my role, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, even if my role isn't to say the things that Imani is saying, I can still hold those in myself and be a part of Definitely. showing those words to the world. You know what I mean? Because the better my half is, 
the better it's going to make her. So if you guys are still listening, uh, we're running out of time right now. We are going to be closing up, but uh, I do want to mention that I am not going to do any editing at all on this show. It's actually going to go up just as is. Great. Um, because why? My big take, yeah. Find out what kind of music we got playing. Uh, no music until you guys can come in with music if you guys want to. No, we were talking about the yeah, editing. Oh, Could oh, music oh. Overlapping yeah. us. We'll find out. Um, we'll definitely find out. No, but we still have the recording. Yeah, yeah, we got. Yeah, our... that's what I'm saying. So we would have looked at you more. <laughs> I know. Sorry, guys. It, it, we would have looked at you more. It, 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 it's okay because, like I said. Um, if you guys really want and you're still interested in to what I was proposing earlier is if you guys want to make up your own band for my show, that would be awesome. Yeah, I mean, definitely. If you ever want us to come back on, you know, talk to us. Oh, uh, I'm definitely, I got to hear from the viewers. Um, We're some big uh, food connoisseurs. We can give some food reviews around town and things like that. Just bring us back on the show. I I, I would love to have you guys back. Um, Partner up with some Sack Chasers Media. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. (laughs) And Get the rest of the boys up in here. And I would love to see what you guys actually have um, outside of theater more than what we was talking about because most of the time that we was talking about was theater. But yeah, to yeah. Hood Street. Definitely check out Hood Street. Right, be on the lookout for that. Yep, we, uh, we're on IMVD right now. And uh, that'll be up there yeah, soon. Production Look right out for, for Sack that, Chasers so. Media on YouTube. Right. So look out for Sean's podcast. Exactly. So anyway, Do your spe- research. Spe- everybody. Speaking of podcast, speaking of TV, this show is actually going to be on Channel ninety five. As is, I'm going to re- look at the footage. I'm probably going to look at the footage probably like about the first ten minutes. If I like the sound and I know I have the sound. And then it's going up as is. If not, you got to edit it, yeah. Then if not, I do have to do editing, and I don't want to. All right. I'm, I'm trying to save the editing. So we're done. Experience. And this is Sean Richard's show called Do Your Research. This do is Palmer. Research. Palmer, Palmer Little. And Mike. Cabral, yeah. Signing off. Been a good one. We'll see you guys next time. Hit that record. Let's talk about button. button.